This is video number 10 in our series on the study of the book of Revelation. And in this video, we're going to do a little bit of a reflection on what we've already studied. And I want to talk with you about some things that God started talking with me about last night in my sleep, actually. I kind of love it when he does that because there's no way that I could put these puzzle pieces together. To be honest, when I finished the video yesterday, I know the things that God has revealed to me, but I started to feel a little bit unsettled about some of the gaps in my understanding. And I've told you, we have to learn how to sit with that ambiguity without running to man to fill in the gaps for us. God is perfectly capable of doing that. And he's perfectly capable of doing it in a way that we could not, you know, proving it to us in a way that we, there's no way that I just go to sleep and I fill in these gaps myself. I've told you before also that God will make you sleepy and he will put you to sleep in order to rest in him, in order to trust him. But you also have to enter that rest. Now, what does that mean? What does it look like? What it means is you can't go run to trying to figure it out on your own or trying to figure it out through someone else's commentary. I'll tell you what I did. I started sewing and sobbing. <laughs> That's what I did. Sobbing and crying out to him and telling him, if I've been deceived, you tell me that I've been deceived. If I don't understand something correctly, please tell me. Take all of the deceptions out of my heart. And I honestly, I, that was what I did. I just kept crying out to him. And that's what he wants. That's what he wants. He wants to make sure that we are for him that he is our only source of truth, that we are not double-minded, and that we're going to tolerate whatever ambiguity there is and trust that he will reveal it to us. And so I didn't feel him telling me that I had been deceived. I didn't feel him, you know, rebuking me for stepping apart from him and then I ingested something that was false. I didn't feel him saying that. But if I don't have the answers, I get unsettled. And concerned because I want to make sure that I'm speaking correctly. And so that's what I was bringing to him, telling him, you've put me in this role. You've brought me to this place. I need to know that I'm speaking correctly. I cannot have certain gaps. I need to know 100% that this is what's going on. So I think that was a little bit of a, it was an opportunity that he was raising for me to kind of seal up any doubt in what he's taught me. Um, because part of what I experience is I have people come against, you know, as you well know, I've had, I have people that come against me on the channel. I delete their comments and I block them from the channel because there's no sense in having that chaos. I'm not going to allow it in or allow any of you to become unsettled or distracted by the chaos that they're trying to create in the community. And we don't need to be ingesting or being exposed to their false doctrines. Now, that's different if someone comes on the channel and even if I believe that what they're saying is false, but they're speaking on scripture and they're willing to speak with me based on scripture, that's a totally different thing. I'll engage with that because if they're speaking on God's authority, then that means that they're holding God's authority as the source of truth. So eventually we're going to get there. But a while back, I had someone come on the channel and he kept insisting that the, that the witnesses were not going to be here until after the Antichrist reign or during the Antichrist reign or something like that. Really insistent on it, but they weren't providing a cohesive stance based on scripture. They were citing some scriptures, so I, I engaged with them for a bit, but it became apparent that they were very stuck on this timeline that they had. The other thing that I saw is that they had their own channel. They had their own channel and they had hundreds of thousands of subscribers, which is always a red flag for me. <laughs> if the world's accepting your message, there's a problem. And in looking through the videos that they had on their channel, I saw that they just kind of share whatever people are saying, whatever dream, whatever vision, whatever delusion of their mind. And when I confronted them about it, they again insisted on their story, but they never actually put together a cohesive argument. And so I finally, they kept arguing on the channel. And I finally said, look, if you can put together a cohesive argument or position, doesn't need to be an argument based on scripture, then I'll concede. I'll have this conversation with you. But until you can do that, all you're doing is bringing confusion to the channel. So I need you to stop it or you'll be removed. I may not be able to control what's going on out there, but I can darn well control what's going on over here. 
And God says, don't, let allow, don't allow chaos and dissension into the community. In fact, that's one of the things that he hates are people who bring that. So that started to bug me as I was, you know, looking at these gaps. It started to not only bug me, but it started to concern me because I want to make sure, again, that I am speaking correctly, that I know that the things that I've heard from him are from him. So that's what I was taking up with him last night. And of course, he began to talk with me. And it is like the most amazing, faithful experience or experience of God's faithfulness. And it truly has encouraged me today. So as I've been sitting with him today and thanking him for responding to my cry, I started to write out the different things that he was talking with me about in my sleep. And so in the previous video, one of the things that I got tripped up on is this thing that happened where he's talking about the seals of Revelation, or excuse me, the seals in chapter six. We know that those seals are chronological, at least one through six. And then there's a break in scripture where he starts talking about the 144,000 who are the witnesses of God. And then he starts talking about the seventh seal. And so my concern was if one through six are chronological, why is seven not? Why is it out here kind of hanging out? And to be honest, I don't know why that is. I don't know why he chose to do it that way because there's absolutely indication that, you know, you have the first seal, which is uh, the Antichrist. You see him with one crown riding on a horse, bent on conquest. Then you see the different things that are happening during that time. Then you see the, the witnesses have been killed. Then you see that the sun is going to turn dark. And the moon is going to turn red and the stars are going to fall from the sky, which you know is the, at the time of the resurrection. And how do you know that? Because Jesus told us that in Matthew, 29, Matthew 24, 29. Immediately following the distress of those days, which is that 45-day period of God's great wrath when God's people are still going to be here. And then the resurrection is going to happen. The mystery of God will take place. So you see that, and then you see God's great wrath. You see the people trying to hide and calling to the uh, rocks to fall on them and kill them. So you know that chron chronology. Now, let me ask you something. Are the 144,000 who we know in Revelation 7 are being sealed before the trumpets? So they're here, but they're not here during God's great wrath. They're not here after the resurrection because you also saw in Revelation 11 that they're going to rise at the same time everyone else is rising. Why would they be here for God's great wrath? They're going to the wedding supper of the Lamb just as everyone else who has participated in the resurrection is going to that wedding supper. And so that seventh seal, I, you know, I still don't know why it is that it's written this way, but we can be certain that, re that the seventh seal in Revelation is not chronological. And maybe God wrote it that way because he wants people who really are pursuing him and he doesn't just spoon feed us. I mean, we know that's true because that's the reason he spoke in parable. He wants people who have the eyes to see, but he also wants people who pursue him to understand. So I can confidently and gratefully report that that gap in my understanding has been sealed. He has given me confirmation that I have understood correctly. Then he showed me in Revelation 11... Uh, you might remember on the other video that I think it was uh, video nine where we were re reading Revelation and it talks about John was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Okay. I told you in Daniel that the sanctuary is thrown down and the daily sacrifice. So he's using this same language here, which is very interesting. He is describing to us who are the witnesses. They are the temple. That's why John is measuring them. So if you know that God's people are the temple of God, then you understand this passage. If you have understood the rest of the New Testament, that God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, that we are his temple, that God desires those who worship in truth and in spirit in sight of this temple, that we will not be worshiping on a temple on the mount or in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come where true worshipers will worship God in truth and in the spirit. 
where's the spirit in our hearts? And God is spirit. So if you understand that context, then you're going to see a little bit more of a glimpse of what God's heart is and what he's saying here. And it's going to reconcile what's written in Daniel because that was that's one of the arguments that people bring as well. And that that person was bringing that, that the temple is going to be built in, in Jerusalem. Okay. All right. <laughs> With all the war and chaos that's going on over there, there's going to be a temple built. And the problem is that many false teachers have come and they've distorted our understanding of what that's going to look like. Are, is everyone suddenly going to come on the same page and say, okay, we'll share a temple with you? I mean, give me a break. That's ridiculous. We are Jerusalem. We are Israel. We are the temple. We are the church. We are the body. All of these things have been done in order to help us to understand who we are in him and who he is in us. So when John is given this reed like a measuring rod and told to go measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshipers, that's the symbolism. We're supposed to understand that this is not a physical temple. We're supposed to understand that he is accounting for God's people, but exclude the Gentiles who are going to trample on God's people, who are going to trample on what God has established. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, period. Not part of the same sentence, period. And I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Not talking about timeline. So same principle is being set up here. He's talking about one thing. And just because he's going in terms of uh, chronology or sequence, he has every ability to switch it up or to just say, here's what's going to happen. And this is also going to happen. There's no indication, actually, that this is saying that they will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and at the same time, he's going to appoint his two witnesses. Again, I spoke with you about other reasons why we know this within the word in the previous video, but the thing that I always, always go back to is the heart of God. What has he established? He has established that he sends his prophets first in order to warn before he brings destruction, that we are handed over to the spirit that we have chosen. And the reason he knows that we've chosen that spirit is because he has given us so many opportunities to change course and we haven't responded. And it just so happens that the opportunities he's going to give us is one, sending his servants, two, sending four of those trumpets. Because when he blows that trumpet... When he sends these things, God's people are supposed to recognize that he is the one who's sending it and that he's sending it because we've gotten far and that if we want to be healed, if we want to come out of captivity, if we want to be restored, that we have to return to him. So that's a well-established pattern and there's no reason why God would be switching it up now. The other thing that he's shown me is that in the fifth trumpet, you see that all of God's servants have already been sealed. That is the servants that remained. So we're not talking about the witnesses because the witnesses have already died. How do we know that? Because they're sealed before the first four trumpets are blown. Why the first four trumpets? Because that's when the witnesses, the witnesses are going to be here during those four, first four trumpets. And then the beast is given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And then the beast rises from that abyss and overpowers and kills the witnesses. And then when the, by the time the fifth trumpet is blown, those things are allowed, the locust, army of locusts is allowed to, to torment, but not kill, torment everyone who does not have the seal of God. So by that time, we know that God's people who are going to be harvested in, the remaining remnant of God's people, the multitude in white robes, they will have returned when God sent those things. But now they're going to be put through the fire. They're not going to be pre-tribulation raptured. They're going to be put through the fire. They're going to be purified, spot, made spotless, and refined. And they are going to be put through the hour of trial and testing that God is going to bring on the entire earth. So we can be certain of the timing of these events. Scripture absolutely confirms it. God's pattern and his heart confirms it. So now we can proceed with the study because I can't go on. If I have any kind of doubt as I'm, as I'm recounting this, as I'm talking about it, I have to pause and I got to return to him and make sure. 
that's my process. I don't just say, well, I've already told people this, so I'm going to keep going. No, I, I am perfectly willing to be corrected. And frankly, I don't feel settled until it's clear to me. So I just wanted you to understand that part of my process and I wanted to go back through that. Now, one of the other things that he's been showing me this morning or this afternoon is regarding Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon its heads. Now, I've been telling you that the Antichrist is going to, I, I have demonstrated for you in scripture First of all, that the United States is the false prophet. Second of all, that this beast is being formed with NATO. Third, that the Antichrist is going to rise. And by process of elimination within scripture, the only option was for that to be papal Rome. That is the one that has fallen and go, is going to rise again and go to perdition. Papal Rome. This is the harlot, the woman that is riding the beast. The government system. And you know, I've been, God has been causing me to reflect on some of the things that have happened in my own family with regard to that harlot and the things that she has done, the filth. All of the people who've come forward and said, I was in a, an orphanage and this happened. They stole me from my family and this happened. They kidnapped me. They murdered little children. This priest and that priest did you know did these things my family member committed suicide because they couldn't take the memories of that abuse and lately he's been causing me i never actually even put this together i don't know why but i think sometimes there's things that happen in the family that you just can't deal with at the moment um but god is slowly chipping away at dealing with it but a lot of the the intense insidious abuse that happened in my family happened through my grandfather who was raised in an orphanage, in a Catholic orphanage. And we too heard stories of what happened in that orphanage, of them being beat, of them being called bastards, of them being sexually abused. And if you watch these documentaries, you see over and over the same story. It doesn't matter what country they're in, the same grooming, the same stories, and the same response of that harlot of Babylon the Great, whose sins are piled up to heaven, who is holding a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. But she dresses herself in purple and scarlet. She's glittering in gold with precious stones and pearls. She says, I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. She has destroyed lives. She also fornicates with the kings of the earth. And so she's not held accountable here on earth. She just skirts around and does the same with those priests who have been hurting and destroying the lives of children. Just send them to another country, send them into hiding, send them somewhere else to do the same thing that they did before. They are never defrocked. They are never held accountable because the spirit that is in this disgusting system, desires to keep hurting people, desires to destroy God's people. And you know, I think it's interesting that Jesus says, come out of her, my people. And of course, this is the whole system of Babylon. Babylon the great, the mother of all prostitutes. She's got children. And those are the ones that bore out of the Reformation, who made a name for themselves, who continue in her practices. And God says, come out of her, come out of Babylon, lest you bear in her sins because her, or excuse me, her plagues because her sins are piled up to heaven. You keep sending your children to a priest and a church who does these things. Are you not going to bear in those sins? Look, I'm not a person to judge, but I am going to discern based on what God's word says. If you don't love truth and you keep going back to idolizing these priests and pastors, stuff's going to happen. And it's not because God is evil. It's because we made that decision to go back to that thing. And I was watching a documentary the other night and one of the nuns was who really, she should have known. And I, ha I have questions as to whether or not she knew what this priest was doing to men, to both boys and girls. Same thing with my grandfather, by the way, same pattern of those priests. And she started talking about the responsibility of the family. And you know what? At first, it really got under my skin because I felt that she was pawning off responsibility. And she probably was. Nevertheless, she's right. 
Why didn't those children feel that they could talk with their family? Why weren't they in communication with their families? Why is it that after all of these stories that have come out, that people just keep turning their heads, that they, it doesn't register for them that this is going on in the Catholic church and that these things don't go on in God's church? What Bible are they reading? Because these things are not allowed. God is not going to support these things in his own church. People who do these things do not love truth. Plain and simple, that's what the word says. Not my judgment, it's what the word says. Now, the context with which Jesus is saying that is he's talking about the great wrath. But you also have to understand that if these are things that we continue to defer to, that we continue to bring our children to, we will also bear in those sins right now. And in part, bearing in those sins right now helps us to understand and helps us to wake up and come out of before it's too late. And then we're in God's great wrath. So if you're having trouble making sense of why it is that God allows these things, why it is that he would send these things, what kind of a God am I preaching? Think about our own responsibility. Now, the thing I want to tell you about this in Revelation 12 is that this too, and I, you know, when I went through this in other videos where I talk about why it is that papal Rome is the Antichrist, is the only option for the Antichrist uh, by process of elimination, by the beast that they're talking about between Daniel and Revelation. So I'm not going to get into that in, in this series. You can go back and listen to that video. But here we also have other confirmation, more confirmation. So again, the passage states, Revelation 12, 3, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous dragon with seven heads, 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. And in Daniel 7, 24, we know that the 10 horns are 10 kings. Then again, in Revelation 13, 1, we see that the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and on each head, a blasphemous name. Revelation 17, 3, then the angel carried me away into the spirit into a wilderness there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. So what I'm trying to show you right now so that you understand is I'm trying to show you the association between this beast and the harlot. They have to go together. It's a, a woman riding a beast. And the crazy thing is, is that Pope Francis says that God does not want church and state to be combined. Well, what is papal Rome then? He's trying to distract and bamboozle you so that you don't see what's behind the curtain. But that is pretty clear to me that this harlot is constantly fornicating with the kings of the earth. That's why she's not held accountable because no other cult would be getting away with what they have done. And Rome has always been governed by the Pope, Vatican City State and the Holy See. But what is the Holy See? It is the supreme body of government of the Catholic Church, a sovereign juridical entity under international law. Juridical means relating to judicial proceedings and the administration of the law. So what is this man talking about? And again, Revelation seventeen seven. then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and 10 horns. And then he goes on to explain that mystery. So you see that this is a combination of church and state. Then Revelation 17, 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So let me ask you something. Can you see why when the persecution of the Catholic church and its history was so fresh on the hearts of God's people who were trying to escape her, why when they were pointing the finger at the Catholic church and they were saying, this is the Antichrist, we know that this is the Antichrist. Can you see why they had a theologian from the Catholic church rewrite the scroll and add to the scroll in order to make a case that the Antichrist is a man? But you can see very clearly that the Antichrist is not a man. It is a, it is a woman writing a system. It is a church that is fornicating with the kings of the earth that is writing a government system that's very clear between Daniel and Revelation. There is no man that is going to rise out of this. This is a system. And this is a system that has always persecuted God's people, 
has always done the things, exactly the things that we are reading in scripture, that we're going to end up reading in scripture when we get to these chapters in order to afford herself all of these luxuries and power and glory. And that is why the prostitutes continue in her ways. And it is why Jesus says, pay her back, pay her back double for what she's done to you. There's no question in my mind that this is the Antichrist system. You study what they have done for, I think it was 600 years is how long the Spanish Inquisition lasted. This continued. They stole children from their homes. I mean, they've been doing this for thousands of years. They're still doing it. These are the things that they're supposedly apologizing for now, but they continue doing these things. I mean, I don't even know what an apology means to them. They have these distorted ways of confessing and then everything's okay. And you see it in the things that the priests do, where they'll say to a child, call them into their office, have you been masturbating? All right, show me what you've been doing and now confess. It's okay as long as you do this in my office and then confess. Absolutely disgusting. I've heard these stories over and over and over from people plagued with addictions and mental illness and all of the things that we call these things in the world. That is what that harlot has done to children. That is what that harlot continues to cover up. There is no God in that. I'm sorry to be graphic about these things, but you need to know just how serious this is. How serious all of the abominations and filth of this system so that you can truly understand and not only the abominations and filth, but, the, but what they cover up, they continue to cover it up and send those wolves out to children yet again and again and again. Only a system with the spirit of Satan would do these things. And you know, I'm going to tell you something really crazy. It may sound crazy to you. To me, it just blows me away. I've never really been in within you know in the catholic community i've gone to their church a couple times and it felt disgusting to me when i was a kid and maybe i was like spending the night at my friend's house and went to church with them the next day it's always felt sick to me and that's coming from someone who was raised mormon but at the very end right before the father drew me to the son there was a group of catholics who were so set on getting me converted and honestly they did it in sort of subtle covert ways because I had no, I, I really didn't realize it until later, the things that they were doing. Oh, come to our meditation group. Come to our blah, blah, blah. There's a monastery in my town and they would invite me over there. Oh, let's walk through and you can tell us the story of this. They were really doing their best to try to convert me and bring me over to them. And I know that's the spirit of Satan. I know that he was trying to lure me into thinking that this was godliness and thank God he did not let me be deceived. There were some things that I ingested that had to be cleaned out of me, but he did not let me, he did not lead me down that road. And there could have been a lot of temptations because I'll tell you one thing about that community is that they really support each other and they'll vouch for each other in business and, and all of these other things. And they're very, very much concerned with getting rich, being successful in business. The church totally supports that. Why? Because the church benefits from their offerings. There is no amount of money that is worth choosing that spirit of Satan and allowing him to operate through you. Because if you choose him, if you choose the money, you choose him and he will operate through you. And then you will bear in the plagues of that satanic system. It just kind of blows me away. Every last ditch effort that was being made to steal my soul, to get his claws back into me. And it's so true that if we are his, if we, are, if we belong to Christ, no one is going to snatch us out of his hands. But you have to understand that I resisted those temptations. So it's a mutual thing. If we are really in him, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to resist all of those temptations. We're going to lean into him. We're going to understand truth. And if we don't, we're not in him. One thing that I want to tell you is I know people who ingested these things in counterfeit Christianity and deception is not being brought out of them. And I want to tell you something that is concerning. If deception is not being brought out of you, you need to pray that it's brought out of you and you need to pursue God's spirit. And you need to also correct what you have said to other people. 
so that you do not present a stumbling block to them. You need to correct it with your children. If God is bringing you out of Babylon, then he will be bringing those deceptions out of you. And if he's not, there's a problem. You need to seek him on that. And you need to become a vessel of truth, sharing with others what the truth is, sharing with others where you were wrong. If he does that with me, then he's got to do it with others. I'm not unique. This is what he does. He brings you out of Babylon, then he brings Babylon out of you, and you need to be used in order to bring others out, just the same as he's using me to bring others out. And if that means that you have to admit that you were wrong, who cares? What does that matter? If that ends up saving a soul, what does that matter? What does your pride matter? In fact, you need to be rid of that. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a teaser for what we're going to be studying uh, as we get to Revelation 12. Uh, well, excuse me, we've already read 12, uh, 13, and 17, because now in these next videos, we're going to start getting into that beast and understanding a little bit more about what it is and the harlot. And I have posted a few videos. I know I've said I'm not going to get back into it. I will touch on it. How about that? I'll touch on what I've talked about in those other videos um, because we're going to need to understand between Daniel and Revelation by process of elimination that the false prophet is the United States and the Antichrist is papal Rome. There's no other option and no one else who fits this description the way that they do. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.